and had an impact on the lives of everyone in every town, in every village, in every street in our country. 100 years later, we are all connected to the First World War, either through our own family history or because of the way it changed the history of our communities. As we have already heard, following a rallying cry by the War Secretary, Lord Kitchener, battalions of men were formed across the country. These bands of brothers were kitted out and sent off for basic training. Men from every walk of life, from clerks and teachers to factory and shop workers. They were crammed together to form what was commonly known as Bands of Brothers. Over many tough months, these volunteers left their old lives far behind. They learned military discipline, drill, and how to fight with rifle and bayonet. Their lives were now controlled by the army. <coughs> commenced on the 31st of July 1917 and stretched on into November. The final phase, the advance on Passchendaele, took place in October and November. The aim being to take the strategically important high ground of the Passchendaele Ridge. The first battle of Passchendaele on the 12th of October failed to take the village and the second Battle of Passchendaele lasted from the 26th of October until the 10th of November. Over the three months of the battle, with 325,000 Allied and 260,000 German casualties, the result was little more than to expand the ground covered by the Ypres salient, and the controversy over the conduct of the battle remains to this day. Uh, at this point, again, then we'd like to welcome back David Windle from the Blackpool uh, Tower Circus and also Helen Andrews from the Blackpool Symphony Orchestra. A round of applause. David is not just the uh, musical director at the Blackpool Tower Circus, he's also a composer in his own right. And as you know uh, from the programme, we have a very special treat tonight. We've got, it's not the world premiere of David's piece, because we had that at Singleton last week. <laughs> but it's a world premiere for Polton, and I'll let David explain. He's a bit tall, actually. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard about Passchendaele, uh, the piece I wrote uh, was based on some notes found on the soldier's headstone, uh, which we'll come into that in a moment. But basically, Second Lieutenant Hugh Gordon Langton was born in Brockley, London, in 1885. In civilian life, he was a brilliant violinist who studied the instrument in Prague, Russia, and Germany. He then joined up the 4th Battalion London, London Regiment, the Royal Fusiliers, and unfortunately was killed in action in the Battle of Passchendaele. Sorry, it's a bit emotional. Because he was killed in action during the Battle of Passchendaele on the 26th of October 1917 at the age of 32, leaving grieving parents and his widow owner. 
His headstone is the most unusual head one in the, within the Commonwealth War Grave Commission, in that it is the only one to have musical notes inscribed upon it. Helen will now play those six notes. suggestions as to what the melody is, or even the fact that it could be um, the, the popular song of the time uh, after the ball. Well, a certain sentiment of um, many heart has been broken definitely fits. No one has ever been able to identify the melody. I know an author called Lucy London, and I was at home doing some work one day, and she sent me a telephone message on the internet. Did I recognise the melody? So I played it over, I said no, no. I thought, hang on. So I began to feel the harmony, and the melody you're about to hear came out of those six notes. In a way, I like to think it was Hugh God Langton telling me what to write. I don't know how it works, but it came. Please enjoy.
there were those who spoke out. Members of the suffragist movement wrote an open letter containing a public message for peace addressed to the women of Germany and Austria. The open Christmas letter was written in acknowledgement of the mounting horror of modern war. Dear sisters, the Christmas message sounds like a mockery to a world at war, but come what may, we hold our faith in peace and goodwill between nations. Though our sons are sent to slay each other, and our hearts are torn by the cruelty of this fate, we will let no bitterness enter into this tragedy, nor mar with hate the heroism of their sacrifice. We are doing our utmost to soften the lot of your civilians and war prisoners within our shores, and rely on your goodness of heart to do the same for ours in Germany and Austria. Do you not feel that the vast slaughter of our opposing armies is a stain on civilization and Christianity? We must all urge that peace be made with appeal to wisdom and reason. In the last resort, it is these which must decide the issues. Peace on earth is gone, but by renewal of our faith, Christmas should strengthen both you and us, and all womanhood, to strive for its return. We are yours in this sisterhood of sorrow, Emily Hobhouse and a hundred others. The poet Wilfred Owen lived in Fleetwood in 1916 when he was 23. As a second lieutenant in the Manchester Regiment, he stayed at the North Euston Hotel while commanding the gunnery range where Fleetwood Golf Club now stands. His poem Dulce et Decorum Est, was written during World War I and is arguably the most powerful war poem ever. One of Owen's most renowned works, it is known for its horrific imagery describing the effects of a gas attack. This poem is so graphic even by modern day standards, it is still thought of as an unforgettable condemnation of the horrors of trench warfare. With its intense tone, it truly gives the reader an insight of what being on the front line would have been like. The title is part of a Latin phrase, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which means how sweet and honourable it is to die for one's country. Owen clearly disagreed with the sentiment. <coughs>
Lancaster. He was 45 at the outbreak of war and so was too old to join up, but he did volunteer to become a nursing orderly and served with the Red Cross in France. His poem, For the Fallen, was published in 1914. There are seven verses in all, but the third and fourth that you will hear now are by far the best known and are used in remembrance services every year. His words pay a fitting tribute to the fallen. When we get to that point, please repeat the final line of the poem. That will be followed by a one minute silence. Will you all please stand? They went with song to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old as we are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Please be seated.
think that is nearly the end of our uh, commemoration concert. Um, I think the Minister Paul uh, would like to just say a few words before we finish. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, you're just going to have to do the first half again for me. <laughs> okay, because I only made it for tea and coffee, and the second half has just been um, incredible. And to hear the figure, 15 million? 16 million. Uh, across everything. And nine, you know, 9 million on the battlefield, nearly 1 million of those British and Commonwealth uh, fatalities. <laughs> The numbers are incredible. 20,000 on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Uh, you know, the numbers are incredible, aren't they? Um, it's getting down into the individual stories. Um, Second Lieutenant Langton is buried in Polkapel British Cemetery in Belgium, and I was there at the beginning of October. Um, so I'm delighted that you waited till the second half. Um, to play your piece, which I thought was absolutely marvellous and what a wonderful, wonderful idea to take those six notes and transform them into something absolutely beautiful. So thank you. <laughs> Buried in the same graveyard as Langton, incidentally, is the youngest recorded casualty of World War I, uh, a private by the name of John Condon, who is 14 years old. Um, there is historical di dispute about that, but he is the youngest recorded casualty uh, of the Great War. Um, the Great War just covers all sorts, doesn't it? But the important thing now, 100 years on, is that it's still not forgotten, and that those individual stories live on and they are told because that's how we remember and that's how we move on isn't it written on the wall um, in one of the uh, blocks in Auschwitz uh, is those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it um, so we must remember we must commemorate not glamorize ever but we remember and we vow never to go back to those situations that cause such a lost life I've said thank you, sir and madam, for your wonderful contribution this evening. Thank you, Light Sands Visuals as well, because they've added to it as well. Thank you for conducting this mob of people <laughs> and keeping them in time. For you as well, for all your incredible as well. Thank you to you all for being here as well. Um, and for being a part of something that is bigger than just us, that has reached out across time and reached out across space and will continue to reach out into the future as well, so long as we do our part in remembering. Thank you.